Orbital bombardment is one of the most devastating and imprecise aspects of warfare in the Star Wars universe, thanks to the sheer power generated by turbo laser weaponry. The ability to completely annihilate targets from orbit made large warships with dozens of turbo lasers a frightening prospect, especially for the Rebel Alliance, which fought an empire armed with millions of such vessels and often lacked the capability to deal with many of them at once. Not even hidden bases were safe from such strikes. A single Imperial Star Destroyer was capable of raising an entire planet. A devastating attack known in military code as a Base Delta Zero operation. Attention, Sergeant on deck! Both the Republic Navy and the Imperial Navy frequently changed what their codes meant to make the work of enemy spies more difficult, including those codes used to designate specific combat maneuvers aboard warships. But one code among these never changed. For millennia, across a complete regime change, one military code always retained the same meaning, Base Delta Zero. The operation received the additional code of Order 37 during the Clone Wars, but Base Delta Zero remained the most well-known code for such operations, and the one most frequently used by naval commanders. A Base Delta Zero planetary bombardment was quite simple but exceptionally devastating. A fleet that received the order would spread out in orbit above a planet and turn their turbo lasers toward it, pummeling the planet until its entire crust melted. All life on the planet would be completely destroyed, as well as structures, landmarks, or anything hidden on the world. By the time the operation was complete, the planet would be completely unrecognizable, as the entire surface would have been completely destroyed, replaced by a layer of molten slag. The slag, of course, would cool with time, but the results would nonetheless be a barren wasteland of rock, usually uninhabitable due to atmospheric changes incurred by the attack. Such devastating attacks were rare, but they were a threat nonetheless, especially during the Galactic Civil War. As the Empire demonstrated through the construction of its Death Stars, not to mention the Galaxy Gun and the Tarkin, it considered whole planets to be acceptable losses in certain circumstances. And as the Rebels usually hid their bases deep in the wilderness of planets they operated on, the Empire frequently considered base Delta Zero strikes on otherwise uninhabited worlds that were known to harbor Rebel bases. On the surface, it would seem that, aside from moral considerations, the base Delta Zero came with the major downside of time. You'd expect raising an entire planet with Star Destroyers to take a few days at least, right? If so, you'd be wrong. A small fleet of just three Star Destroyers was capable of completing a base Delta Zero strike in the span of a few hours, and that's only when they're being thorough. Most life on the planet would be gone before the first hour was up. For those of you wondering how on earth that's possible, let's take a look at turbo lasers for a moment. Turbo lasers were basically a scaled up version of laser cannons, which were themselves scaled up versions of blaster technology. Now, it should be clarified that neither turbo lasers nor laser cannons actually fired lasers. Indeed, laser weaponry was vastly inferior and considered primitive by the time of the Galactic Civil War. Laser is used to describe the bolts fired by such weapons in universe as a sort of slang born of ignorance. Laser cannons and turbo lasers are named what they are because lasers are part of their internal mechanisms, which is what differentiates them from blaster weapons. Blasters operate by energizing blasted gas, usually to Tabana or related compound, and then focusing the results onto a compressed packet of highly energized particulars, frequently referred to as a bolt. These bolts traveled through the air until they collided with the targets. Upon impact, the physical force of the collision would generate an immense amount of heat, which was capable of melting through duracrete and some metals, and the energy condensed into the bolt would be released in a small explosion, which would deal even more damage to a target. Laser cannons followed similar mechanisms, but on a much larger scale. Because of this, obviously, the effect of laser cannon blasts was dramatically more powerful than that of laser bolts. 
Laser cannons also differentiated from blasters in that they used internal laser systems to focus the bolts more, allowing for larger and more powerful explosions. And lasers were also sometimes used in the later stages of the weapon firing to make shots more accurate, vaguely similar to how rifling is used to ensure greater accuracy for real-world firearms. Turbo lasers take the internal mechanisms of laser cannons and scale them up even more. In the laser cannon, we already have an extraordinarily devastating weapon. Most capital ship grade laser cannons are capable of one-shotting your average tall building. Turbo lasers perform the process of compressing and energizing the bolts that they fired multiple times, allowing them to build up massive amounts of energy before being fired. These bolts were then cycled through galvan coils in the barrel of the cannon, which increased the bolts' power and gave them special properties that allowed them to pierce warship shields more easily. As a result, a single turbo laser bolt was insanely powerful, equivalent to your average thermonuclear bomb, though a bit more condensed and without the radiation. A single shot from the turbo lasers used by Imperial Star Destroyers could vaporize a small city, and a turbo laser volley could do a whole lot of damage to the surface of a planet. That should also give you an idea of just how strong the average warship shield was, as most were intended to withstand sustained turbo laser fire. The sheer power of turbo lasers is why nuclear weapons weren't used much in the Star Wars universe by the way. Turbo lasers were capable of doing far more damage while consuming fewer resources, and they came without the radiation downside. By the time of the Galactic Civil War, pretty much everyone looked down on nuclear weapons as being unnecessarily messy. With the power of just one turbo laser bolt in mind, let's take a look at the Imperial Star Destroyer. The first generation ISD featured six dual heavy turbo laser turrets, akin to those used by Venator class Star Destroyers, 60 heavy turbo laser batteries, and seven turbo lasers. The second generation ISD unwisely disposed of the extensive point defense system used by the first generation warship in favor of even more turbo lasers and featured eight massive octuple barbette turbo lasers, 50 heavy turbo laser batteries, an additional 50 heavy turbo laser cannons and over 26 lighter turbo laser batteries. This was an absolutely ridiculous amount of firepower that ultimately proved to be useless against the fast moving starfighters fielded by the Rebel Alliance, which the Star Destroyer no longer had any point defense system to repel with. Now back to base Delta Zero strikes. Though the Empire was the most famous for using them, they predated it by a few thousand years. The code was in use by the Republic Navy during the Sith Wars, and the various Sith factions that the Republic fought in those times were no stranger to the maneuver either. Infamously, Darth Malik ordered Admiral Saw Karath to execute orbital bombardments of Telos IV and the city planet Tyrus during the Jedi Civil War. The former strike rendered the planet completely uninhabitable, forcing an extensive terraforming effort in the years after the war, while Taurus, which had been a well-known local hotspot, was more or less wiped from the face of the galaxy by its own bombardment. The operation became particularly notorious during the Clone Wars. The Republic Navy, especially in the later stages of the war, often ordered base Delta Zero operations against planets where the droid army was entrenched deep into the world's crust, as ground operations to flush them out were usually deemed too costly. The Confederacy of Independent Systems also executed such strikes, with the most infamous case being Humberine, a city planet and Republic founding world that General Grievous melted over the course of a single hour. The Republic Navy's growing habit of executing base Delta Zero strikes when the predicted ground cost was too high passed on to the Imperial Navy, which often relied on the threat of such attacks to keep rebellious worlds in line. In 19 BBY, the Empire executed a base Delta Zero attack on Kamas in retaliation for the Kamasi causing problems for the New Order, and in 4 ABY, the Empire attempted to do the same to Nar Shaddaa, though the fleet sent to do so was routed before it got within range of the moon. So that's an in-depth look at orbital bombardment, especially base Delta Zero operations. Are there any other common military maneuvers you'd like to see us take a look at next? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments section below, and 
Just before you go guys, as per usual, make sure you check out all those links in the description below waiting for your clicks to join us on our Geetsleys Gaming Network, our main Geetsleys Discord, and if you're into history, we have our second history channel called The Front that discusses all the niche and unknown topics of World War II, so make sure you check them all out in the description below. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.